This is NDTV. And you're watching NDTV Prime. In association with Micromax. Nothing like anything. The Mobilio drives in. Just how good is the seven-seater Honda MUV? We drive the more powerful Hyundai Eon with a one-liter Kappa engine. Better looks, upgraded features, and reconfigured price positioning on the Ford Fiesta. And it's the crossover attempt from Toyota, the Etios Cross. So all of that is coming your way over the next 30 minutes. We're going to start off, of course, with the Honda Mobilio. Welcome to CNB. Now, the MUV space, never considered sexy, isn't it? But the Mobilio is going to try and change that to some extent. It is going to look primarily at individual buyers, not at fleet buyers. Bala had the chance to drive the car near Nashik, and uh, I can tell you, we've got plenty to share with you. It was one of the big debuts at the February Auto Expo. It has caught the imagination of the Indian consumer already. And frankly, we can't recall a multi-utility vehicle launch getting so much attention. The Honda Mobilio is no doubt one of the year's most anticipated launches. So, is all the hoopla over this MUV justified? Now, given the huge interest for the Honda Mobilio, we at CNB decided to check with our Facebook community to get a sense of the right positioning of the car. Will it purely take on the likes of the Ertiga and the Enjoy, or does it have enough to challenge the Innova? And the majority opinion was clearly that it will take on only the Ertiga and the Enjoy, and the Innova is really something out of its league. But that could change a bit, given that Honda is looking to increase the premium appeal of the car by offering the RS variant on the top-end diesel with a little more sportiness and a lot more features on the inside. And this could attract potential Innova customers. But at least those who buy the Innova as a family car and yet want to stay more upmarket than the fleet buyer. Honda has a fairly extensive global MUV range, but the choice of the Mobilio for India and Southeast Asia seems logical with its relatively compact proportions. Built on an extended version of the Brio platform, the MUV uses Honda's man maximum machine minimum philosophy to offer more space on the inside and it also attempts better looks than its rivals. You do see resemblances of the Brio and the Amaze from the front, but there are a few noticeable design changes that they have done on the front. Uh, you can see the grille which extends all the way to the headlamp, one nice wide line that forms here. As well as on the large lower bumper, you see these wing-like shape near the fog lamp housing, which really comes out and gives the car a lot more appeal. Uh, but on the RS variant, which is a little more sportier, you do see a lot more design element changes, including new projector headlamps, uh, redesigned front and rear bumper. You got the twin slat chrome grille, you got the rooftop spoiler, as well as a very fantastic set of looking of alloy wheels. It's from the side that the Mobilio looks its best. The character lines and a new lightning bolt belt line highlighting some sportiness. The rising roof line and the extended three-row window glass that connects to the tailgate blend well. The ground clearance of 189mm is higher than the Ertiga and Innova's and yet the car doesn't look too tall or raised. The rear is also more attractive than a typical MUV with a contoured tailgate and flared rear fenders adding some drama 
especially to the rear three-fourths view. We got down to driving the diesel variant, which is expected to be the volumes driver for Honda. The familiar 1.5 liter ID Tech continues to impress with claimed mileage at 24.2 km per liter. The IV Tech petrol engine will offer 17.3 km to the liter, says Honda. Both figures are well ahead of competitors' claims. To boost fuel efficiency, Honda has enhanced friction reduction in both engines. Now I must say I'm pretty impressed with the 1.5 litre diesel engine. We always knew it was a powerful engine, but now it's a little less noisy than it is on the Amaze. That's because Honda engineers have really worked on insulating the cabin uh, to make the overall driving experience inside the cabin a little better. Also what's really fun is the gear shifts are quick and smooth and the acceleration is also very, very responsive. But what's not so fun is the steering which feels very light and you really don't enjoy it at high speeds. So while the steering lacks feel and precision, the Mobilio's diesel engine certainly is exciting. 98 bhp of power and a very generous 200 nm of torque. The 1.5 liter i VTEC offers 117 bhp and 145 nm of torque. Honda is only offering the 5-speed manual on both variants with no immediate plans to bring in the CVT gearbox for India. The sedan-like monocoque chassis means a fairly smooth drive and even on bad roads the suspension isn't too stiff. The minimum turning radius of 5.2 meters on the petrol variant is quite handy in city driving conditions although the turning radius on the diesel is marginally higher at 5.4 meters due to the engine size and weight. We were driving close to Nashik, by the way, and Bala decided to drive into a small township close by and invite people for a short ride in the new vehicle to put Honda's claims of great space inside the cabin and good drivability with a full load to the test. In terms of space, it looks okay with the, seven, with the five passengers at the rear, but we'll see how the car performs with those uh, passengers behind. Seven adults means not just a change in cabin occupancy but also weight, which gave us a chance to check out the suspension setup under full load. The car feels heavier alright and body roll gets enhanced straight away too. But luckily the diesel engine has the grunt to still pull through fairly well. Honda has used high tensile steel in the frame of the Mobilio to increase energy absorption and minimize impact. The top end variant with us has dual front airbags and ABS or anti-lock braking with electronic brake force distribution or EBD. Honda won't tell us just yet what features from that list will be across variants at the time of launch but we do expect dual front airbags to be standard across all variants. The car's luggage space with all seats deployed is good enough for small suitcases. The third row folds completely of course and then the Mobilio offers 521 litres of cargo space. The back of the first and second row seats are slightly concave to offer additional knee room to passengers seated behind them. Now we always knew that the Honda Mobilio was going to be spacious on the inside and you really get a sense of that while sitting in the second row because you've got plenty of leg room, the headroom is pretty awesome uh, because the roof line is rising and the kind of headroom that's available on the second row is pretty good. Also what a couple of things that add to the overall comfort are the rear AC vents with controls in them. Uh, also, you've got a nice little armrest which folds out uh, as well as the armrest on the uh, doors itself with cubby holes for storage. Uh, also, what gives you the larger sense of space inside the cabin are the large windows which gives the overall cabin a lot more airy feeling to it overall. I don't expect the third row to kind of give you this kind of space. Let's just see how good that one is. Now the third row of the Mobilio is quite impressive because you don't expect uh, that much amount of legroom obviously but it's still sufficient for an adult. Uh, but possibly the only factor is that your knees are slightly placed up which means that on long rides this could get a little bit uncomfortable. But in terms of space wise it's fairly decent, the headroom is still there. You got a pretty large window for the third row which doesn't give you a sense of being cramped at all. Uh, also you've got a little bit of uh, storage space here, you have cubby holes uh, for a cup holder as well as to keep your mobile phone. 
But overall, I think the third row is a nice place to sit in for adults and not just small children. The dashboard of the Mobilio is not so boring with the top-end variants getting a wood finish in the center console with a touch screen that includes navigation and you've also got leatherette seats. The base model has beige and black interiors with fabric seats. The seats themselves are slim and have integrated headrests, but they're comfortable. The instrument cluster has protruding triple analog meters with white and blue illumination for a slightly premium feel and better visibility. Expect the market launch for this car to happen in a few weeks and prices to range between 8 and 12 lakh rupees that's smack in between the Ertiga and the Innova. So it throws up a challenge to both. For now it seems the Mobilio lives up to all the hype around it. But if Honda wants another hit on its hands, it will have to play smart with pricing, a lesson that the company seems to have learned by now in India. So we live in hope. Now, I do hope Honda does get it right with pricing on the Mobilio. How do you like the car? Do you think there's potential there for that segment to grow as well? Share your thoughts with us. It is time for a short break here on CNB. We'll be back, but with plenty more, don't worry. Welcome back to CNB. Now let's talk about the Hyundai Eon with that one liter Kappa engine. It's good to see that kind of choice coming into this space now. It is getting a little bit more crowded. Here's what we think of the car. The Hyundai i10 was launched in October 2011 and was touted as the first real challenger to the mighty Maruti Suzuki Alto. It did get some attention, but was largely seen as a better, yet pricier alternative. The Alto also had the K10 variant with a bigger engine, and then we got the Alto 800, which made the car a little better looking too. And now with the entry market hatch getting more crowded, with the roomier and more powerful Datsun Go driving in, it really was time for Hyundai to hit back. So finally, India gets Hyundai's 1.0-litre three-cylinder engine from the updated Kappa 2 family of engines. This engine was so far offered only on the i10 in Europe. And India is the first market to get the Eon with this configuration. So is it different? Yes, you can tell that this is a different engine. It's uh, got a little bit of an additional power feel to it that instantly does come through and uh, overall vibrations have gone down so you get a sense of refinement it's a lot smoother the overall drive as well the downside the engine has a rumbly quality to it that sound filters into the cabin which isn't really great and uh, takes some getting used to the low-end torque on this engine is surprisingly not there. I mean, it's just not to the satisfying level anyway. And so for me, that's a bit of a downer because even though you get that extra part, the lack of that low-end torque is a little annoying because it means you're going to end up switching gears a little more often than you'd like to in bad city traffic. The figures do tell a more positive story and I have to say the gear shift itself is more satisfying than on the 800cc variant as the gearbox appears to be better mated to this unit. Handling feels a bit more sure, but most of the other driving dynamics are similar to the existing variants. The car's interiors and trim are also largely unchanged, with no new features popping up in the 1.0-litre variant. The car has been launched in only the Magna Plus variant and so on overall features and comforts, the 800cc Top End Sports is still better loaded. Plus that variant gets a driver side airbag while the new 1 litre variant does not. 
the new 1 litre Magna Plus is priced at 3 lakh 83 thousand rupees at showroom Delhi. So from one new variant, let's talk about a facelift now. The Ford Fiesta looks a lot better, has been repositioned on price, but the petrol's gone, it's diesel only. Let's take a look at the details. There were great expectations from Ford in 2012, when after its Figo high, it was expected to deliver another hit. The new Fiesta missed that mark badly, though its SUV persona, the Echo Sport, has hit the bullseye. Emboldened by that success, Ford is seeking a new lease of life for the Fiesta. So it's time for the facelift to drive in. This is the same car that was shown at the February Auto Expo. Now Ford says that the new Fiesta is more aerodynamic than its predecessor. The fact that it has spent 150 hours in the wind tunnel bears testimony to exactly that. The car is also way more attractive now. The trapezoidal front grille is in line with global Ford sedans like the Taurus and Mondeo. Yes, yes, it's very Aston Martin inspired, we know. The Fiesta is now only available with a 1.5-litre diesel engine that has 90 bhp on tap. Ford has done away with the petrol engine completely, so you can also forget about the dual-clutch automatic variant, sadly. The interiors are much the same, but the car's sync system has been upgraded, and it continues to cover everything from voice command to Bluetooth to an emergency assistance system, and that is much like the Echo Sports. Besides that, it can read out text messages and it also gives you a pathway to access your smartphone apps on the go. The sedan is available in three variants. Ambiente at 7,69,000 rupees, Trend at 8,55,000 rupees and the top-end Titanium at 9,29,500 rupees. While Ford doesn't expect the new Fiesta to give too much worry to the city or the Verna, it is indeed the right approach in terms of styling, pricing and repositioning of the Fiesta in the Indian market. Now it's been slammed as being a pseudo crossover by many, but still there's lots of attention on the Etios Cross from Toyota. The company says it's already got more than 5,400 bookings for the car. There's a three month waiting period already. So if you want to get your hands on one, well, perhaps you need to do it quickly. But before you can do that, here's our review. Kailash Menon spent some time with the car and has the complete lowdown. This is the Etios Cross. It's butch, it's brawny and it comes kitted with the style and trappings of a compact crossover. Toyota has spruced up the lacklustre lever and given it a pseudo SUV silhouette. So, are you wondering why? Toyota is targeting the youth with the ETOS Cross, the youth who craves the style and stance of an SUV but doesn't have the money to go out and buy one. So the Cross essentially is a rough and ready version of the road-going lever. What's new? Well, up front you get uh, integrated grill guard which looks the part but then again it's all show because it's all plastic. You come to the sides, you have this black plastic cladding running from the front all the way up to the rear of the car. And you also get SUV style staples like a roof rail and skid plates up front. You come to the back, there is a stylish rear spoiler and Etios Cross branding on the boot lid. But then again, take the Cross branding with a pinch of salt because the Cross doesn't really have any off-roading abilities. That's right, even the ground clearance stays the same. The only difference in dimensions, it's 120mm longer, 40mm taller and 45mm wider than the Liva hatch. Other cosmetic changes include integrated indicators on the outside rear view mirrors and fancy diamond cut alloy wheels. The Cross comes in both petrol and diesel options. Doing duty in the diesel, Cross is the tried and tested 1.4-litre D4D engine. 
Since the changes on the cross are purely cosmetic, the power output of 67 bhp and torque of 170 nm remain unchanged. And another thing that remains a constant is the diesel clatter that makes its way into the cabin. What's new on the insides? Well, the dashboard gets a black piano theme to it, which, to be honest, has livened things up. I mean, it doesn't look dull and drab like the Leva hatch. You also get a tuned-in audio system with Bluetooth aux and the USB. Uh, the steering is wrapped in leather and the top end variant gets steering mounted audio controls. Also, you get sporty seats with the Etios Cross branding stitched on them. So basically, the Cross is all show and no go. Bottom line, it's got the cosmetic trappings of a compact crossover, but barring the brawny bits, it's pretty much a lever. The petrol cross starts at 5,76,000 and the top-end petrol will set you back by 7,35,000 rupees ex-showroom Delhi. The diesel starts at 6,90,000 rupees and goes all the way up to 7,40,600 rupees, which by our standards is a bit steep. A sticker price lipstick on a pig. It's red, it's hot, it's very sexy and extremely powerful. That's the CLA 45 AMG from Mercedes-Benz. We will have the review of this hot car on the program next week. Until then, promise me you'll wear your seatbelts or your helmets if you're on a two-wheeler. Please don't use your cell phones when you're driving. And remember, Auto Prime right through the week, 8.30 p.m. on NDTV Prime, brings you the best from the world of wheels. Bye-bye.